Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, come on, let's rest on our feet. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing as we're standing, and we're, we're ready. We, we've gathered. We, we got out of bed. The Lord woke us up. We pressed our way. Some of us uh, drove, you know, at the legal speed. Some of us were rushing, amen. But we're still here in Jesus' name, amen. Anybody come to give him glory on today? Did anybody come to give him glory on today? Hallelujah. We declare the glory of the Lord in this place. When we consider the works of his fingers, the moon, the sun, the stars, we declare that he will be glorified in the earth. And we're going to glorify him in this place today. Amen. Hallelujah. He said he ain't going to share his glory with nobody. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey.
the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning, New Morning Star. Sound like y'all come ready to praise. Well, I know Brother James Allen did. He came back and he got his trumpet with him. Brother, if you want to prepare solo like Amazing Grace or whatever, just to grace us at some point in the service, if you can, we'll just do a few bars with the musicians, but just as a testimony of God's faithfulness to you. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is coming from Psalm 90, and it reads, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were born. You turn man back into dust and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when you pass by. Or as a watch in the night, you have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep in the morning, they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone, and we fly away. So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, together, and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. Let's pray. Father, we are here gathered together to celebrate the wonder of who you are once again. You brought, brought us from a mighty long way, and we just come to say thank you, Master. Now continue to receive our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. greatness of the Lord in this place. No one like you. No one like you.
no one like him. Hallelujah, he's still working great miracles. Hallelujah, he's a great God. Hallelujah.
I think right there is a good place to dance. One, two, three, four. You know, as the choir was singing, my heart is fixed, my mind's made up. In spite of how I feel, my mind's made up. You know, God's been too good to me, my mind's made up. No matter what the devil throws at me, God is too good. No way I'm gonna turn around now. You know, we're giving God praise and we're giving God glory this morning because my dear brother Allen is over there on the horn sounding really, really good and God has brought him a mighty long way. This morning, brother Harold Stevens was in the sanctuary. God is such a good God, such a good God. We've been praying for you, brother, and we've been praying for Brother Stevens that God allowed them to come back into the house of prayer. It's just something about knowing Jesus. When you're on your bed of affliction and you can't come to the house of the Lord, when the Lord raised you up because you have a made-up mind and because your heart's fixed, you get back in the place you left because God is so good. Not only him, but I'm talking about so many of us who's been sick and who's been away. And God's brought us back into his house one more time just to give him glory and just to give him honor. God is such a good God. If you're able, will you please stand to your feet as we go before our great God and our great King. There's no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do the same for you. If you will, will you grab your neighbor by the hand as we go before our God and our King. Let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, how great you are. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You are God alone. You are in a class all by yourself. I remember the song said, I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I looked high and low, still couldn't find nobody. No one greater than you. Master, as we stand in your presence, God, we want to say thank you for being good. As a matter of fact, you've been better than good. God, you've been better to us than we can be to ourselves. God, you've made ways out of no way and opened doors and healed bodies and regulated minds and you just keep doing the impossible in our lives. Thank you, God, that you're all sufficient, God, and you're capable in all of your ways. Master, as we stand in your presence, we ask you, Lord, if you will please, sir, forgive us of our sins because all of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Every single one of us, God, has done something, God, this week, God, to offend your holy heart. And we confess it in your presence right now. Thank you, Lord, for the cleansing that you give us, God, when we confess to you. Masters, we stand in your presence. We thank you again for bringing Brother Allen back in our midst, God. God, it's been a long journey, God, and you've been faithful throughout his journey. God, thank you for Sister Allen, God, as you strengthened her, God, as she stood by his side, God, and prayed and cried and fasted and prayed, God, for her husband. God, thank you, Lord, that you've proven once again that no one can do it like you. You've proven once again that you are God alone. 
God, we thank you so much, God, for Brother Stevens as you brought him back to our 8 o'clock service, God. Uh, giving him enough strength to climb the stairs, God. God, we pray for Brother Joe Calloway as he's recouping, God, as he's healing, God. We thank you, God, that healing virtues flowing in his body even right now. God, for every saint, God, who's suffering from some sort of ailment, God, I pray that you will cover them in the matchless name of Jesus. God, that you will, God, just bring them back to their rightful spot, to your house of worship, so they can lift holy hands and say, it was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. I pray for the bishop of this house, the man of God, who's going to preach the word of God. Strengthen and encourage God. Allow him to preach with power, precision, and persuasion. Convincing someone who does not know you in the pardon of their sin that to see their need for you. And they'll come run and ask them, what must they do to be saved? I pray for every saint under the sound of my voice. God, that you will continue to bless them, God. That you will continue to increase their territory, God, that you would continue to encourage them. For Pastor Nero, for myself, and every man who's holding up the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ, God, that you would strengthen and encourage us, God, to preach a little while longer. Be glorified in this service. Be highly exalted in Jesus' name. Can the church say amen? amen. Will you all please remain standing for our congregational hymn? Amen. I'm going to show you all just how good this brother is. Brother, brother Allen, I want you to come over here and uh, we're going to do our fly away and he's just going to do it like he feels it. And uh, we're going to turn on this red mic here. You, you, you'll catch on. I'll fly away. Let's take it from the top. Here we go. Some glad morning when this life is over. Okay, brothers on the next line. Come on, put your hands together. Oh. Come on, go, brother.
Amen. Why don't you all take a few minutes to greet one another in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, New Morning Star. This is Pastor Dwayne Davis. Earlier this year, I presented a new format for the Wednesday evening Bible study by adding home group Bible study fellowships. Several individuals signed up to attend as well as become host homes for the studies. Needless to say, it was a great success. This past Wednesday, however, was our final Bible study of the year and we celebrated it over dinner and lighthearted conversation. Reverend Collis Smith and the Bible study which still meets here at the church concluded their time as well. Of course, they had more food than the rest of us. Anyway, when we start up again next year in the month of March, we'd like more of you to attend Bible study here at the church or start a group study in your home or join one that already exists. Ask anyone that's a part of a group and they'll tell you how great it is. See you next time. Yes, I am here to present our newest member of New Morning Star, Sister LaShawn um, Holiday. Would you come forward? Come on up. Step right up. A couple weeks ago, we had new members class and I had the privilege to spend some intimate sister girlfriend time with Sister LaShawn, and we really um, got to just really dig into God's word and uh, where we are, where we want to go, um, how we see ourselves now and in the future. I'm going to pass the mic to Sister LaShawn, and she is going to um, tell you what she got out of the class, let you know what ministry she's going to be participating in, because here at New Morning Star, all of our members are a part of ministries, right? But before I do that, for anyone who has not completed a new member's class, it doesn't matter when you came down the aisle, we have amnesty for you. <laughs> On Saturday, um, December 7th at 9 a.m., we will have one last class for 2019. We're trying to get everybody to come on in the room. So again, Saturday, December 7th at 9 a.m., promptly call the office to get registered. You will hear from someone pretty much right after that, but that'll be our last opportunity for 2019 for you to complete new members class. Sister LaShawn, take it away. Hey, how y'all doing? Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna give, God, give honor to God, to who is the head of my life. Uh, I thank God for Pastor Davis and Sister Davis. Uh, I've been living over here in the building next door for about maybe eight or nine months since March, and I've been coming around here to the church, okay, and I just joined, what, maybe about three weeks ago? About three or four weeks ago, I just joined and became a member, and I'm thanking you all and keep, for keeping me in your prayers and, and welcoming me to the New Morning Star as a member of the church. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> She told me that I also had to become a member. To become a member, I had to participate in something, in, uh, being a uh, participant in something going on in this church. So I'm going to be participating in whatever they call for me to do, and I signed up to be uh, helping in the food pantry. Amen. All right. So just, wait, 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 wait. Just a little point of clarity. So as a member, we like for all of our members, we're a family, right? And I don't know about you all, but when you were growing up, everybody had to do something in the house to keep the house moving. So that's the spirit behind it. As a member of this church, we enthusiastically expect everyone to be a part of some ministry to help move this cross. Um, we're going to pray for Sister LaShawn and then we'll, we'll get out of the way. But really quickly, the certificate says, like you've never heard me read this, Certificate of Completion. This certifies that LaShawn Holiday has completed the new member's orientation course and is now and is received now as a new member of our church. And it was dated for November 9th of 2019, and it is signed by our pastor, Dwayne F. Davis Sr. Family, if you would stand and re reach your hand this way, we're going to pray for our sister. God, we love you and we magnify you. We thank you for one more saint that you've brought to this part of your vineyard to work um, 
to bring other saints in, Father God. We thank you that you've tr entrusted her with us. We thank you for her zeal and, and her willingness to work wherever you've called her to work, Father God. Be with us for the remainder of this day. You get all the glory and all the honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. As we prepare for our offering this morning, I tell you all, this church loves to give. We've been talking about this, my church, my challenge too, and people are still giving. Now we're up to $26,860. Saints, since y'all love to give, here's what we're gonna do. Since we're nearing the $30,000 mark, let's just do $30,000. So between now and the end of the year, for those of y'all who couldn't do October or November and you still wanted to give, let's just continue to challenge and just raise the bar to 30 grand to see if we can finish that out by the end of the year. I believe we can do it. We asked for 10, we got 17, we asked for 20, we got 26. May as well cap it off at 30. And saints, let me tell you something. You cannot be God-giving. For those of you whom God has blessed your life tremendously and gave back to you or more what you've given to him, please come out this Thursday and just come and share that testimony in addition to others. I was with Brother Robert Moore just yesterday, and we were having lunch together. And just over, just over the lunch, we talked about some great things God was doing. And he shared a testimony of how God re-blessed him for what he did. And then I said, we ended up, well, actually, I ended up tearing up. Because just seeing the hand of God become faithful to us as we are faithful to him, I know there are so many other testimonies, and I can't wait to get here this coming Thursday to see what God is doing in your life as a result of, watch this, not just giving for him, but living for him. And as we give our sacrifices this morning, we want to give him glory even through this. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we just want to bless your holy name for being awesome to us. Lord, you are a good God, and we can never repay you for the goodness and the kindness that you've shown toward us. But Lord, you require that we bring something into this storehouse so that we can continue to invest in the kingdom of God, sowing into good ground. Now, oh God, use what we give this morning to continue to do just that. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord as we are in the season of Thanksgiving. Every day is a day of Thanksgiving. But we're going to lift up this praise. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Amen. Come on, y'all know this. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go.
your Bibles. Open them up to, once again, the book of Genesis, chapter 47. Near the end of the chapter, we're going to conclude our preaching verse by verse through the book of Genesis. In my series, I started back in 2008. Rewind back to the beginning. And we've come now to the end of chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47, verses 27 through 31 reads, Now Israel lived in the land of Egypt, in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. But when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. He said, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed in worship at the head of the bed. This morning I want to preach about Jacob's final days on earth. Shall we pray? God our Father, how grateful we are that once again we can open up the narrative in your word where you have used this man of God, Jacob, from the time we met him to the time now of the days drawing near his death in the text, we are still ministered to by your word. Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts that we may receive wondrous things, that our hearts may not just be enlightened and inspired, but God, you would give us holy application to put into practice what we read. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me. I want no more. Here's my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. Can we sing that together? Fill our cup, Lord. Fill our cup, Lord. We lift it up, Lord. Come and quench. Come and quench this thirsting, this thirsting of our souls. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, oh, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me whole and all god's people said amen. amen amen you may take your seat jacob's final days on earth there was a well-known television program back in the day which ran from 1968 up into the year 2012. it was on abc for 44 years, this program, or as you all call it, stories, captivated the interests of viewers all around the country. The title of this particular show made the viewers seriously think about life. No, it wasn't General Hospital. <laughs> it wasn't Young and the Restless. It was not Guiding Light. It was not Days of Our Lives. No, it wasn't All My Children. Nor was it As the World Turns. Nor was it Secret Storm. The program was titled One Life to Live. 
Now that title in and of itself caused people to reflect about the truths that you only get one life. And it talked about the brevity of life. But it also caused one to ask the question, what am I doing with this one life to live that I have? As Jacob nears the end of the one life he had to live, do you all remember when we first met him at his birth back in Genesis chapter 25, which was the halfway point of the Bible? So his life covers about half of the book of Genesis. And it is this latter half of Jacob's life we see the better half of him. I want to talk a little bit directly to you seniors this morning, but indirectly to the rest of us. We see Jacob in the better part of his life at the latter part of his life. For you seniors, the latter part of your life should be the better part of your life. Amen. Amen. God didn't leave you here for a reason to just suffer and whine and then die on the vine. You have value as a senior and you should be living your best time of your life right now. And although Jacob had such a tumultuous life by his own doing and through the hand of other people, he has truly at this point become a man of faith. That most recent life-threatening trial that Jacob went through in his old age, it was due to a severe seven-year famine that happened in the land of Egypt. Why do I say it was life-threatening? Well, because God had made Jacob a promise that I'm going to give you lots of descendants. I'm going to make you a great people. I'm going to give you land by which to settle in, and then I'm going to make your name great. But this famine threatened to wipe out his entire generation. How were they going to survive this famine? Well, to his surprise and amazement, God had already sent his son Joseph ahead of time to become the vice regent or the second in command to Pharaoh and rescue them from the famine and settle them now into the land of where? Goshen. Why Goshen? Because God wanted his people to live a separate life away from the influences of the Egyptian culture. This was the seedbed or the incubator for the people of God, and God didn't want any germs to contaminate the holy people that he was raising up in an Egyptian society. I got to step off the mat and step back here and let you all know it is no different with God's people today. God does not want us to allow the germs of this world to contaminate us. And that's why he put us in a church and he has called us to live a holy and a sanctified life separated from the influences of this world. Now we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Let me say that again. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We shouldn't be falling down to the dementia uh, uh, or the degrading, I should say, the degrading morals of the world. We are the church, you all, and God has called us to live very distinct lives. So the church is our Goshen. And you should go to Goshen as much as you possibly can so that you can continue to sanctify yourself and set yourself apart as God's people. It is breaking my heart today to see how worldly the church has become. We are becoming like the Egyptians. We are becoming like the sinful Americans, and we take in the same thing they take in. We listen to the same thing they listen. We do the same things that they do. Saints, for you as a believer, you ought to live a distinct life in this world because God want some holy people, not fleshly people going to church, but spirit-filled people going to church and being sent out into the world. So God sends his people to Goshen because in Goshen, they will be well taken care of. And the brothers, y'all remember in last of the verses I preached ahead of time, they were given government jobs. They were going to take care of Pharaoh's livestock and they were going to be important people in the land of Egypt, but they will be in Goshen. Now, in my previous sermon dealing with verses 13 to 26, we saw saw how at the height of the famine, 
God does something miraculous. He gives Joseph wisdom on how to deal with the starving Egyptians in order to get them some food. Y'all remember? Instead of setting up a welfare plan so that they can get subsidies from the government, no, Joseph made them pay for the food. And when they ran out of money, Joseph made them sell their cattle for food. And when they ran out of cattle, Joseph had them sell their land for food. And when Pharaoh took all the land, they sold themselves into servitude for Pharaoh. Nobody in Egypt got a free lunch. Had it not been, though, for Joseph in the land of Egypt doing this, listen to me, you all. Egypt would have been wiped off the face of the earth. So whenever you hear the country Egypt, think of Joseph. They are around because God used him to spare the Egyptian people. So that's where we left off a week ago. This morning, we return back to the narrative, and we're going to now compare how Jacob's family was getting along during the tail end of the famine and beyond. Whereas the people of Egypt were struggling, under a bad economy, we first of all ex- observe Jacob family prospers. Jacob family is prospering in the tail end of the famine. And they prospered in three ways. The first way, they had good living. They had good living. Verse 27a says, now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen. Now, Moses here, who's the writer of Genesis, for the very first time, he refers to the group of people who lived in Goshen as Israel. In this chapter, you'll see the word Israel, then you'll see the word Jacob. Sometimes it's referring to Jacob, sometimes it's referring to the nation. Here it's referring to the nation. And he said they lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen. Now that word there has a twofold meaning. Yes, it points to where they were located in the land geographically, but it also suggests how they were living. See, while Egypt was struggling, Israel was satisfied. While Egypt was hungry, Israel was happy. While Egypt was pitiful, Israel was peaceful. While Egypt was broke, Israel was blessed. So blessed that we see them prospering, secondly, with not only good living, but good land. Look at the next part of the verse. And they acquired property in it. Say they were so blessed that this, say, this is in the middle of the family. They out buying real estate. They, they purchased or owned or leased property from Pharaoh, and they began building homes. They took up residence, and they began to build communities build marketplaces, they, they, they built banks, they built shopping centers, they built schools. <laughs> Their economy was booming while Egypt's economy was busted. See, isn't this interesting that to this day, and, and I hope, uh, you know, you know, y'all don't think that I'm making a Semitic statement here or an, a pro-Semitic statement or an anti-Semitic statement, but God put something on the Jews, y'all. He put some anointing on the Jews where money works for them. Okay, if Jewtown was open today, <laughs> that place would be packed while you get your Maxwell Street Polish. Y'all remember that Jewtown back in the day? All they was making money hand over fist over our community, but to this day, they own much of the world. Because God has put a special anointing on that race that they just got the economic thing flowing through their veins. And we should be mad at them. God's blessing is upon that nation. And we better bless them. Why? Because God says, those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And I'm not talking about the bad people in Israel. I'm talking about just the nation in general. Matter of fact, y'all do know that's why United States still have a good relationship with Israel. It dates all the way back to the founding fathers and their Christian roots honoring Israel and wanting to make a pact with them so that we could get blessed. Because the psalmist says, pray for the peace of Israel. 
That's one of the things that we do. Now, I'm not pro-Semitic or anti-Semitic. I'm just saying what I'm saying this morning. Look at them striving in the middle of an economy and in a famine. They are the only place in that region that's on 10. And the rest of the world is struggling. Oh, saints, y'all, I, I, I hope y'all understand what I'm saying. So, so if you got good living and you got good land, of course, that's just going to autom <laughs> automatically lead to some good loving. <laughs> Look at what it says. And were fruitful and became very numerous. So, saints, there was a whole lot of marrying going on at that time. There was a whole lot of physical intimacy resulting in babies. I hope you all know that uh, this same phrase, fruitful and multiply here, is the same command in Hebrew, the actual command in Hebrew that God gave to Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. This is what God says. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The physical intimate union between a male husband and a female wife was designed for two reasons, for pleasure and for procreation. Let me say that again. The physical intimate union between a male husband and a female wife was designed by God for two reasons, for pleasure and procreation. Hold it right there. Let me tell y'all something. What we got going on today you might have some pleasure, sinful pleasure, but you can't multiply. You can't procreate. You all out of God's order. If everybody became like that, we wouldn't propagate on the earth because two plugs can't make an electricity. Two sockets don't make electricity. You need a socket and a plug in order to get a godly spark out of life. So after you done <laughs> procreated and reproduced yourself and little yous running around looking like you and acting like you, the rest of it should be all pleasure from then on. You don't finish your procreation day. As a matter of fact, if y'all go on the internet, we had a session here. One of the seniors said, you know, yeah, loving is good, you know, all the way even into your old age. Now, it ain't going to be hot love all the time. but it's going to be love. <laughs> so the physical intimacy is between a male husband and a female wife. Now, Jacob and his descendants did just what God commanded them. Remember, God told him in Genesis 35, verse 11, God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Here it is again. Be fruitful and multiply. As a result, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from you. So we see Jacob and his family, they lived a good quality life. They were prosperous. Saints, because you and I are connected with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, Saints, we should live prosperous as well in every area of our lives. I yeah, about five prosperous people, clap. The rest of the prosperous people just bowed their head. Mm, amen, amen, yeah. But hear me out. You were designed by God to live a prosperous life. You should be living a good life. Now, there are some things you need to stop doing to amplify the good, and there are some things you need to start doing to amplify the good, but God has designed believers to live the best life on the planet, inside and outside. He wants you to live much better lives than your unsaved heathen family, heathen co-workers and neighbors and classmates and people in the neighborhood. He wants you to be spiritually fit because he wants to show you off. He wants to show off his power through us. 
Saints, don't settle for same old, same old, this is good as it gets. I don't know what God you're serving, but the God that I serve, he goes ahead of me and he makes my way prosperous. All you got to do is follow him and bless it. See, people want to follow blessings. You follow God and the blessings follow you after you follow God. Third John, chapter 1, verse 2. Many of y'all, we know this verse. The apostle, the aged, the apostle said, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health. So he said, in all respects, everything you touch, you should be in, he goes, in good health. Then he says, just as your soul prospers. So look at what he says. Everything around you should prosper. Your body should prosper like your soul is prospering. So everything about us should be prosperous. Now, make, make sure you don't miss this. God is not saying everybody going to be rich in the same way. But every, everybody going to be prosperous in the way God has deemed to prosper you. Don't compare your prosperity plan with someone else's prosperity plan. And don't be jealous of somebody else because let me tell you, you don't know what it took for them to get to where they are and to have what they have. Now, if they told you that story and say, would you like to go through what I went through in order to get here? No, nah, I'm straight. <laughs> You know, when Pastor Nero and I traveled to Sister Sharon Williams' uh, mother's service in Memphis, Tennessee, I'm always messing with people. And uh, there was this lady uh, that was checking in all the flight, uh, the, the, uh, the people that's going to get on the flight. And I'm standing in line, and she's just saying to everybody, oh, welcome, welcome aboard. Hope you have a nice flight. Take care. And she was just doing it, you know, scanning it and doing it. I told Pastor Nero, I said, watch this. I'm going to mess with her. So she goes, how you doing? I say, I'm depressed and I don't know what to do with my life. <laughs> she said, honey, if you knew what I went through, you put a smile on your face. You wouldn't want to change places with me. So go and get on that plane and enjoy your flight. <laughs> like we always looking at other people. You don't know what people have been through to prosper them, so you just better go on about your little life and enjoy what God has given you, amen? But God wants you to prosper in every area of your life. Proverbs 10, 22, one of my favorite verses. It says, it is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich. And once you get what he got, you ain't got to be sad with it. You ain't got to be worried with it. You ain't got to be filled with anxiety. He said he adds no sorrow to it. Yeah. Human blessings carry sorrows with it because you got to go get what you need, make it happen, then you got to worry about if you're going to keep it or not. God says, I'm going to make you rich, and you're going to be happy after I bless you. <laughs> David continues to say this in Psalm 107, verse 38. The Bible says, also he blesses them, and they what? multiply greatly. Hold, hold it right there. Say, God is into multiplying our blessings, adding to what we already have to give him glory. So he says he does not let their cattle decrease. Now, I'm no fool. I know Bible uh, exegesis and understanding the context. This is talking about God's covenant people in the Old Testament. Their cattle would not decrease as long as they are in covenant relationship with him. They're going to experience the physical blessings of God. But when you flip that bad fellow over into the New Testament, we have everything in Christ that pertains to life and godliness and God will not hold back anything that we need. We will never decrease in spirituality he always has us on the upswing. Can the church say amen? That's why you got a lot to be thankful about because God has blessed you richly beyond your own righteousness. It's through the righteousness of God through Christ that we have the coattail, hold on to the coattail of God's blessing. So God does want you and me to prosper. So what? So that he can get glory out of our lives. Well, as Jacob's final days on earth were coming to a close, we not only see his family prosper, but secondly, we see Jacob's length of life. Jacob's length of life. In verse 28, it says, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. Though Jacob lived a tumultuous life for 130 years, 
The last 17 years of his life were the best. Talk about saving the best for last. Seniors, let me give you all a tip. Leave them crazy family members alone. Enjoy your senior years. Do not get updates on drama with your kids and your grandkids. You have lived your life. Let them do the knucklehead things that they are doing and let them experience their own consequences. You done been through your tumultuous life already. You don't want to add nobody's tumultuous stuff to your stuff. Free yourself from worrying about grown folks. Take some trips. Pay for me a trip. Your pastor will go with you. And we can live it up, y'all. Stressing yourself out about what Buki is doing and all the junk that their kids are doing. Calling you on the phone. Grandma, it's like, quit calling me. Unless you're going to say, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, and here's a few hundred dollars for you for helping raise me. Y'all, don't, you, y'all know what I'm saying? You, listen, Joseph took Jacob to Goshen. He got out of the stress of the famine in Egypt, and Canaan rather brought him to Egypt, set him up for retirement. He's paying back what his dad invested in him. Jacob, or, J- Jacob was no longer stressed. He was blessed by his children. And saints, hear me out, write this down. I'm no longer going to let my kids, grandkids, great-grandkids move me off my square of being blessed and happy. And just tell them, don't call me with all of that. I don't want to hear that. You got a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, best friend, but talk to them about that stuff. Just call me and tell me the grandkids' grades. (laughs) And when they birthday... (laughs) It's so I can buy a Christmas gift. Let me be a blessing. I, I don't need all the stressing. I want to be a blessing, but you keep stressing me with all of this stuff that's going on. Old people, I'm trying to show you something, Reverend Smith. You, you, more of you seniors need to be walking around with smiles on your faces because you are being blessed. If it's the neighborhood, move out the neighborhood. Go somewhere else and live. I mean, literally, I don't know. I'm just trying to say what I'm trying to say. Enjoy the final years of your life so that when you die, the word blessed are they that dieth in the Lord can apply to you and you're laying in your casket with a smile on your face instead of with a smile on your face when grandkids come by the casket <laughs> you better put a smile on your face some of y'all can, can pass away with that look on your face You want a peaceful look or a happy look. You don't want to be like, I'm so glad I'm gone. (laughs) Oh, my goodness gracious. Think about this. Jacob is living large now. He made it through the famine, and he was able to see his family grow into the numerous people God promised him that he would have. Now, on the average, God does desire longevity for his people. That's on an average. Now, I ain't going to be up here pronouncing and saying, God wants you to live healthy and to live a long life. Everybody in here going to get to the ripe old age of 95. I decree it and declare it. It's like, hush. <laughs> God is the one who gives life and who gives breath, and he gives and he takes away. And there are things we can do to ourselves to escalate that time, but there are some things we can do to prevent ourselves from moving close to that time. But God wants us to stay upon this earth longer, you all. You know why? Because we get to continue to have an influence on those who are still here by looking at our quality of life. How's your quality of life, seniors? 
What kind of life are you living? Are you attractive to your relatives and to your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors? You should be living your best life and walking around, look, with a smile in spite of body parts not acting right. In spite of the pains that you have to deal with, God is still good to you in the midst of it. Yeah. You know, most people want to stay alive because they want to stay near their money. And they want, they want to have a lot of power. I remember my aunt, uh, she was old, way into her late 80s, going into her 90s, and uh, never had a bank, never put her money in the bank. She just saved it at home, and nobody knew where it was, and she would peel off a little here and a little there. And uh, when she died, they were trying to find the money, so they had to clean out her house. This woman had cut a slit in her mattress and pushed the money inside of her mattress because she didn't want nobody touching her mattress. Well, guess what? They found that money in that mattress. That mattress was thrown out and the money was thrown into folks' pockets. Saints, most people want to stay around for money and power. But listen to what the singer David Crosby at the age of 78 says. Time is the final currency, not money not power. When it comes to coming to the final days of your life, people are not asking for more money. People are not asking for more time. No, they, uh, more power rather. No, they want more time. And Jacob here lived in prosperity, prosperity for the last 17 years of his life. Speaking of 17, did you all miss the connection here? What age? was Joseph when his brother sold him into slavery and faked his death. You got it. 17. God gave Jacob back 17 of the years that he invested in his son Joseph, and now Joseph in turn has invested those 17 years back into his daddy. Young folk, middle-aged folk, give back to your parents what they gave to you. Your mother and your father in their old age shouldn't be hurting for nothing. I understand all the relationships are different and on different levels, but you know what? When she was or he was changing your diaper, they weren't concerned about how you was feeling and how, and how bad you was running around the house. They still fed you at 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years old. At least bless them occasionally with something to say, here you go, just wanted to appreciate you. I give you this just because. But look at this. It says that Joseph is now taking care of him. He gets to return the favor. Say, isn't this amazing that God is the God a redemption? Yes. You may feel sometimes like all hope is lost and that you are wasting your years on something that never seems to come. But let me tell you, God has not forgotten your labor of love. God has not forgotten all the things that you have contributed to his name, to his people, and to his family. Yeah, you might feel like you've lost out on some things, like Israel did when they went away from God and God had to send them into Babylonian captivity in order to discipline them. They thought all hope was lost. They couldn't even see themselves getting back to where they used to be. But see, God is still the God of redemption. He told the prophet Joel in chapter 2, he told him to tell the people, verse 23 to 27, so rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. And he has poured down for you the rain, the early and the latter rain as before. Verse 24, the threshing floors, here it is, will be full again of grain and the vats will overflow with new wine and oil. Then I will, look at this, make up to you for the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the creeping locusts, the stripping locusts, and the gnawing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat and be satisfied and you will praise the name of the Lord your God. 
God who has dealt wondrously with you, then my people will never be put to shame. Thus you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. And my people will never be put to shame. God is the God of redemption. Job even said it in Job 14. All the days of my struggle, I'm having a hard time, but I'm going to wait until my change comes. I'm going to wait around until God comes through for me. A lot was taken from me, but God has set me up to give back to me. He also said in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, though this situation has set me back, though I'm not where I want to be, I'm still going to hope in him. Psalm 27 says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Then he tells them, wait for the Lord and be strong and let the heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. God's coming back around to you. He didn't leave you out there by yourself. Mama, you gave everything to them kids. God's going to give you something back. Daddy, you worked your finger to the bone. God's going to pay you back. Church members, you might be old today, but you gave in the past, and God's going to see to it that you finish strong in this life. He's going to pay all of us back. Your first marriage went sour. You did everything you were supposed to do. They left you anyway. They played you anyway. Oh, honey. Oh, brother, God's got somebody waiting in the wing for you. Why? Because he's the God of the rebound. What has rebounded you, that what has bounded you out, he's going to rebound you back again. All you got to do is wait for him. Wait for him. So listen, y'all, don't y'all ever allow the devil, the world, or your flesh depress you about what has happened, about what ain't happening, or what might not happen. See, that's the devil's three tools. Look at what happened. Look what's going on. You ain't going to get what you need in the future. God is able to bounce you back into where you have bounced out of. He's able to correct the wrong. He's able to make the crooked places straight. He's able to make the rough places plain. Jacob discovered that God is the God of the recovered. You were going you to get double for your trouble. You're going to get triple for your trials. You're going to get quadruple because you quietly waited on the Lord. During Jacob's final days on earth, hallelujah, he saw his family prosper. He had the length of life, but then late, lastly, we see Jacob's last request. He makes two requests. The first thing he tells them, tells Joseph is where not to bury him. Verse 29, when the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and in faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. As a citizen of Egypt, Jacob did not possess the power to determine where he would be buried when he died. But Joseph, knowing his last days were coming upon him, he called for Joseph and he appealed to him by way of Joseph's authority and he said, make a covenant with me, an agreement with me don't dig a hole in this soil upon which I was just passing through. This is not my earthly or heavenly resting place because my life story can end in a pagan land. My life story has to end in the promises of God. I'm not going to be buried in a strange land among all strange people. I want to be buried where the people of God had died in hope. I want to be buried where I know I'm going to get up one day. I want to be buried with those who have gone before me into that 
heavenly country. And so he tells them where not to bury him, but then he tells them where to bury him. Look at verse 30. But when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he, meaning Joseph, said, I will do as you have said. He said, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed down in worship at the head of his bed. The reason Jacob asked Joseph to take his body out of Egypt and to take it back to Canaan was because Jacob was a man of faith. He saw the promised land ahead of time. And he was just making arrangements for the future of his bones. He knew that God was going to settle the entire nation back into the land of Canaan, which will eventually become their homeland, Israel, and it is the same Israel to this day. He wanted his bones to be buried beside Abraham and beside Sarah and beside Isaac and Rebekah. He said, take me back to where you laid my sweetheart, Rachel. I don't want to be in a strange land. I want to lay down with my father. And he was talking about the cave of Machpelah that Abraham had purchased when Sarah died in Genesis chapter 23. But Jacob believed in a heavenly country. He believed in heaven and the resurrection of the body when God would raise up those who died in faith to return to Israel. Do you all know that God is going to resurrect the old saints Israel and they are going to reign on the earth? So Jacob says, put me where I'm... Put me where I plan to get up and where I plan to rule and to reign with the promised seed that's going to come back one day. And the dead in Christ and in the Old Testament is going to rise. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews described those who died in faith as I close. All these, including Jacob, died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance... And having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of the country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Look at the last verse of chapter 47. Shows us how to die as people of faith. Then Israel bowed in worship at the head of the bed. Jacob did not fear death. As a matter of fact, he was so cool with death, he didn't know at what moment God was going to come and get him. The Bible says that he himself bowed in worship at the head of the bed. Now, some say leaning on his staff, but the bed was a flat bed on the floor with a pillow. And as Joseph made this covenant with him, look at what Joseph, Jacob does with his final moments of health. He turns around, twists around with the last strength he got and laid his head on the pillow. And the Bible says he worshiped. How about you? When it's come your time to die, how would you like to go out? Wouldn't you like to go out worshiping? Doesn't matter what you're hooked up to. You can worship on a ventilator. Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but can't touch the soul. Your soul is beyond that ventilator. Your soul is beyond that disease. Your soul is beyond where you are. Because deep down in the inside, in the inner woman and in the inner man, as long as you know you have lived a life to please God through Jesus Christ, you can die in peace even though you only got one life to live. Now let me say this in closing. On your way out, make your best, your best exit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this text and for this time we spend in your presence. Lord, we know one of these days that we're going to draw our last breath. But God, that's physical life. When we breathe our last over here, we take a deep breath of heavenly celestial air as we are welcome into your presence to live with you for all of eternity. Lord, for those children and teens and millennials and adults and seniors that are in this building, I pray that you would remind them 
that it's more about the quality of life than the quantity of life. You called us to live an abundant life, and that is because we're connected with Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, God, continue to be glorified in this service, in this church, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Will you all please stand to your feet? As Pastor was preaching about Jacob's final days on the earth, the Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour when Christ will return. What about you this morning? If you were to die right now, are you, can you say in your heart that I'm ready to die and I'm going to live with God in heaven? Can you honestly, wholeheartedly say that? If you can't, you have business to take care of this morning. God sent Jesus ahead of time to pay the penalty that we owed. That's the sin penalty that separates us from having an intimate fellowship and relationship with him. God did that just for you. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. We could do nothing to earn it. But because God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son for you. If you do not know Jesus in the pardon of your sin, you are lost. And if you were to die today, you will eternally be separated from him. But I got good news for you this morning. That you can accept Christ and your sins can be forgiven. All you have to do is recognize that you're lost and see your need for a holy God. And you cannot work for it. You can't be good enough to obtain it. There's nothing you can do on your own but say, Lord, I surrender. I see that I'm a sinner. I see that I'm lost without you, and I deserve hell. But because of your gift, because of Jesus Christ, I too can have eternal life. If you're in the sanctuary this morning, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is your opportunity to have a new life to become born again, to join us, the children, the redeemed of God. If you're in the sanctuary this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can come right now. Is there one? Is there one in the sanctuary who's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? You know, I need to say this while I'm standing here. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did last night, last week. You know, it doesn't even matter what you did before you came here. The only thing that matters is you accepting God's gift of salvation right here, right now. It's not by accident that you're here. Will you please come? You know, you may be saying, hey, well, I'm already saved, but you may be living separated in a backslidden state. You too can come as well. You can come. There's room for you at the cross. There's room for you. You know, you may say, hey, well, I'm none of the above. I'm saved, but I don't have a church home. If you need a church home and you enjoyed the preaching of the word of God in this location, you can come. Candidate for salvation, recommitment, or uh, church membership. Is there one? Is there one? We see that there's none today, but as Pastor always says, there's always room for one more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for the man of God who labored in the word of God. Amen. Such an encouraging message, message that blessed my heart this morning. And I, and I can sense that it blessed you as well. Amen. Please love up on our pastor and first lady as you pre we prepare to go to Sunday school or leave this place. If you can, will you come back as Brother Eddie and uh, his wife are going to renew their vows at 1 o'clock? You've been invited to come back and celebrate their 25th anniversary along with the rest of us. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for the man of God who preached the word of God. God, I pray that you will return unto him the strength that he's deposited into us today. God, that you will refresh him and rejuvenate him. God, and revive him. God, bless us as we're going to Sunday school or wherever we may be going. Now, may the grace of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now and forever. Can the church say amen? Amen. amen.